Tara's already providing uh, announcements of upcoming events that have been changed, so you have an even better opportunity to join. So we're going to start with Sarah Martin from our community practice. If you are not part of the community practice, everyone on this call, I'm assuming, is a GBB expert, so you should definitely join. And um, if you have any questions about that, just let us know um, after this call. And over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Jennifer. I'll turn on my camera briefly, although I don't look as nice as Wonder Woman, but uh, I'm a bit sweaty today, but um, thanks for having me on. Um, I also see a lot of very familiar faces and some uh, not familiar names. So I've put the email address for the COP in the chat box. So just send me an email if you want to join and I'd be happy to help you get onboarded. And I did put in the chat also um, our next event, which is starting on Friday. Um, Micah from IMC is gonna be presenting their new toolkit, uh, Traditions and Opportunities about engaging community leaders in working on GBB. And this is uh, an open webinar for everyone. So please feel free to come in and join us and learn more about that. So um, I, I think it's been a while since I updated on the community of practice. So I wanted to give you just like a little bit of a snapshot of it. So the community of practice is co-facilitated by me and Beth Van. Um, we share duties on this, and um, uh, we are hired as consultants through IMC and seconded, of course, to the GBV AOR. The community of practice started four years ago, um, and it came out of the GBV capacity building strategy, and it was one of the things that was recommended to try to create kind of a pathway for people to be able to um, talk with each other, get advice, mentor each other, connect and kind of continue the learning um, that um, we have. So it's kind of a, you know, um, a place for GPV professionals to chat and hang out with each other. <laughs> At least that's what we, we like to think in our mind. Um, it's uh, hosted on a website called groups.eo, but most people interact with it through email. So we are currently 945 members as of the end of June. Um, we got about 41 new members. Um, usually about uh, 15 to uh, 30 a month are joining. Um, and we don't have a very high dropout rate. The unsubscription uh, rate is usually about three people every four months. So, And that's usually people because we try to follow up to find out why they're leaving. And they're usually leaving the GBB field. A lot of people do when they switch jobs, just change their email address as well. Um, almost all of our members are deployed out in the field. Um, we try to keep it field base because we want this to be a place where people who are out there managing programs or coordinating have a place where they can reach out to find out information. Um, so about 30% of our members um, are working in sub-Saharan Africa and about 27% in the Middle East or Asia. A few more now, we're getting more people in Latin America and the Caribbean, thanks to our Riga, Cecilia, who's been promoting us. And um, with the conflict in Ukraine, we're getting more positions, um, people based in Europe. Um, so it's mostly Eastern Europe. And that the remaining uh, 25 to 26% of people are usually based in headquarters, or they're like a roving global person, or and we do have a lot of consultants who you know kind of uh, shift around from time to time. Um, we also ask where most people are from. Um, more than over 50% are from outside of Europe or North America, and 87% of our members are identify as female, which is probably not a surprise to all of these women sitting on our call right now. So we kind of reflect, I think, the, the global GBV uh, world. So um, it's mostly INGOs and UN um, in the staff. We only capture um, the position when you join the COP. So people move around a lot, but this, so this is just kind of a snapshot in time. It's about 33% work for INGOs, 28% for the UN. Um, and we've been trying to increase the number of local women-led uh, organizations and local NGOs. And that's right now about 12% of our population. So, um, so what do we do? So it is a place where you can reach out to fellow GBV specialists and share what you're doing, ask advice, try to find resources or materials. Um, we have um, lots of different conversations that are taking place. Um, there was um, a conversation about uh, collecting data, you know, something that's always on our minds uh, in the GBV world. Um, we have conversations about like women and girls safe spaces, um, trying to find different resources in different um, languages. Um, 
researchers often will let people know that they're um, going out into the field and that they'd like to connect. So it's a, a variety of different things. But one of the big things that we do is we host um, events. We try to identify where we might see a gap in learning or a gap in um, information in the, uh, in the GBV world. And we try to um, create events or learning opportunities for people to come together on that. So that's why I mentioned the webinar that we're doing on Friday. That's um, specifically IMC approached us and said, we want to launch this. But we also, we're open for any of your organizations. If you guys have a new um, resource out or there's a topic you really wanna talk about, you can just reach out to us, to Beth and I, and we'll help organize something for you. Um, the whole of Syria uh, team reached out to us last year uh, earlier this year, and we did a whole week focused on adolescent girls and GBV um, based on their adolescent girl strategy that they um, had. And each day was focused on a different topic. And we shared the, the directory because um, we have a directory of, of everyone in the COP. So we shared people who have adolescent girl um, expertise. We shared good resources. We had some conversations and um, the whole of Syria shared the work that they had done. So that was, you know, a, a member reaching out to us. Um, uh, we have been looking, you know, the first couple of years of the COP was really about growth and trying to reach members and um, get it up and running. Um, and now we're no longer in a growth phase. It pretty much, um, we don't have to advertise it. Like um, the word of mouth is mostly from other members in the COP. They um, tell each other about it and we get new members that way. Um, so this year we decided to focus more on the capacity building side. So we're doing something slightly different. Um, we did have, you know, probably 15 or 16 webinars last year and all of them are recorded and you can find them on the AOR YouTube channel. Um, but so we were like, okay, people are kind of webinared out, right? I think everyone kind of gets this, um, the same thing in their uh, webinars. You get 300 people sign up and maybe 80 people come. And then if you look in the analytics of the recording, not that many people are necessarily downloading it and watching it. Um, so we were like, how can we kind of try to take some of these gaps and make it um, a different kind of learning experience. So we're currently running three different training programs right now. So we, they're just for community of practice members. Um, the first one is with uh, Paula Ramirez, who I think many of you may know from um, her work on the mindfulness and the trauma sensitive um, stress reduction. She's bringing the same course to the community of practice members. And so we ran one um, session um, in the spring for 20 members and we're running the second one right now. So um, 20 members meet um, for an hour and a half um, for six weeks. And so we do it on Zoom. So that's one thing that we're doing. And then we're doing two other ones and we're trying different kind of styles to see what kind of works because you know everyone is so busy and it's really, really hard to carve out time and to find a place to be able to do you know, more learning. So the next one we did is based off of the GBV AOR advocacy handbook that was launched five years ago, I think. But, um, and Beth is teaching that, Beth Fan, and it's a um, six week course, um, eight week course um, with four live webinars that are recorded. And then every other week there is a chat session. So, and there's homework in there. So people are developing advocacy goals, learning how to write objectives, um, trying to figure out what are the um, channels of communication to advocate for. And we both provide um, feedback to them on their homework. Um, so a lot of people are using their advocacy work that they might be doing in their own project as well. So, um, and that's been um, quite good. We had about, I think we accepted 30 members of which about 22 have been able to um, come regularly. So we're about to have the third, no, the, the fourth webinar um, next week on that. And that course will be over soon. And, and we'll write up a little evaluation of each of these. So if anyone's interested, we'd be happy to share with you. And then the the third course that we're teaching is with uh, Mark Canavera. Um, he's with the Child Protection Working Group, but he's also a specialist on working with people on diverse sexual orientation and gender identity. So it's a three um, session, um, three webinar session um, every two weeks um, where uh, we're exploring the what does diverse sexual orientation, gender identity, um, gender expression, and sex characteristics mean. 
how does gender-based violence impact people with um, with different um, you know sexual orientations? Um, how does humanitarian emergencies uh, how how does that come play out in humanitarian emergencies? And then finally, what do we as GBV practitioners need to know to be able to work with uh, these different vulnerable populations? And that has um, we've had the first session. And Alex Bonella from UNHCR, um, the lead trainer that they have on LGBTQ issues, came and delivered the, the lecture. And then they have some homework in between times. Um, the next lecture will be with um, IRC, um, and they're going to be presenting the findings from their reports that they uh, did recently. And then the third one will be um, more of a kind of discussion and open, um, and it's a, we want it to be a safe place, so it's not recorded, any of the discussions are not recorded, because we want people to be able to ask their questions and to try to, um, you know, figure out what it is that they need to be doing, and we know that there's a lot of confusion, particularly around the terminology, so, um, so that's the, the third session. So um, I think I'm running out of time, so um, I'll just give you a little taster of some of the other things that are going to be coming up. Um, uh, we're going to have a roundtable of uh, GBV and data specialists uh, who are going to kind of explore some of the key challenges that we face in the GBV world on dealing with data. Um, that's going to be sometime in September. Um, we're going to bring our um, GBV uh, information management officers on online to help people find out more about the HNO, what they need to do about that, and kind of highlight the, the work that they're doing. Um, we're working with IRC on the minimum standards rollout and working with local women's organizations on that. Um, we want to have a webinar on comprehensive sexuality education and its role in uh, possibly uh, reducing GBV. And then um, we're going to be collaborating with the help desk on a GBV and climate change uh, webinar. Um, so those will be things in the autumn. And then we've got lots of ideas for other things. And one that um, I'd like to put a little plea out to you guys um, to reach out in your organization. One thing in the capacity building strategy that, um, that we were all keen on when we were writing it, but um, we feel like it has kind of fallen by the wayside is this pathway of how you go from being like a student or a beginner to becoming a GBV specialist. Where is that pathway in there? So we recently collaborated, you know, we're part of the MGBVIE uh, learning uh, program. And so while we were talking with different um, uh, emerging specialists who were going into that, Beth and I were thinking like, maybe we could bring together some um, HR people from your different organizations to kind of answer questions about what they're looking for when they're hiring or to answer some questions um, for people about their career path. So that's something we're kind of excited about, but it's just in the idea stage of the mind. So um, if you have any thoughts or ideas about what you would like to see the community of practice do, please send me a um, email at gbvcop at gmail.com. And Jennifer, if I have time, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you so much, Sarah. It's really exciting, everything that you're doing. Um, just to say, I know that our nutrition person who's coming on has a limited amount of time. So what I would suggest is if people have questions, if you can put them in the chat. And Sarah, are you able to stay online a little bit longer that you could respond on chat? Just five okay. minutes longer because our, our training on uh, diverse Sogiesk starts uh, in 15 minutes. So okay. I have to moderate so, it. If you put your questions on the chat, I, we can capture them and then share them and make sure that you get that information. And just to say, Sarah, so you're aware, since we had our subcluster uh, national level coordinator meeting recently, we have a lot of coordinators on this call. And I know in the past, Sarah has been and Beth have both been asking if there could be more active participation by our coordinators. So just um, if you're not part of the COP, please do follow up with the information that was shared and um, Shiva can also help you with that. Um, but yeah, please do go ahead and put any questions that you have in the chat. And um, I think an interesting question, Sarah, we have not just the career, career path to becoming a GBV actor, but also what's next? I know, you know, that sort of after you've been a coordinator for a few years or a program person for a few years, where can you go from here? I think that's a big question um, that people have. So just to sort of add that to, to the discussion. 
And I just want to throw in there as well for your um, your subcluster or working groups, you'd be working groups. I'm always happy to make a uh, presentation. Um, you can invite me to come and speak uh, at your session. I'll zoom in and uh, give you guys the information. So I'm always happy to do that. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. And that's a great opportunity. And the help desk is also willing to do that. So um, please do take advantage of that opportunity for your subcluster at the national or subnational level. It's either way is absolutely fine. Or if you're a program person and you want to have um, Sarah come and present to a potential audience and, and keeping in mind the women-led organizations are definitely very welcome as well. So um, and you can get support signing up if you if you need that support. So thank you, Sarah. And um, it sounds super exciting. I don't want you to be late to your event. Um, I will hand over and probably Christine will do a better job of introducing the next talk, but it's going to be looking at the correlation between nutrition and GBV and what kind of impact there is. And so um, I think one of the things that's been nice on our calls recently, and I would love to get feedback. I always say we don't get a whole lot of feedback on our calls, but um, I think that uh, we've had a really positive response to um, the sharing of research, because I think all of us are very interested in learning and we don't always have time to, to find out on our own um, or might have questions that we wonder about. So um, we, I think we will continue to in share not just um, standards, but also um, you know, our guidance, but also findings of research. And I think with a lot of the work that's been going on with risk mitigation and, and the focus on working with other clusters, it's really exciting to see how um, doing this work together with other clusters can have a meaningful outcome. So over to you, Christine. Thanks so much, Jen. And can I just double check our time? I think we said 15 minutes for the presentation and then, and then Q &A. And minutes for Q&A. Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, well, huge thanks for the opportunity. Uh, colleagues, as you've heard, you're getting a, a double dose of UNICEF today. So hopefully that's not, <laughs> not too much of the same, uh, the same theme, but um, they're actually quite different presentations. So hopefully it's interesting for you. Um, as Jen said, this first one is gonna be looking at um, a, a, some research that we've been doing over the last couple of years. The most recent uh, sort of iteration of it has been a collaboration between UNICEF, Washington University in St. Louis, and uh, Columbia University. And um, I'm lucky to have on the call with me for this presentation, um, UNICEF colleagues, Elizabeth Rush and Katie Robinette, both of whom work pretty intensively on our, on our nutrition work um, for GBV integration. And also Louisa Vahedi and uh, Luna Johnstone from the academic team um, that's been supporting us. So I'm just gonna kick off with a little bit of background to this project. Um, I think as, as many of you on the call know, um, UNICEF is, uh, has been designated as the lead uh, role for the interagency rollout of the GBV, IC GBV guidelines. And so that means that we, um, in partnership with CARE, host the interagency coordinator for the GBV guidelines reference group, but we also do you know, a lot of work internally with our programmatic sectors and the clusters that we lead to make sure that GBV considerations are integrated. So nutrition is, is one of those. Um, we've had quite a lot of momentum over the last few years in the nutrition sector programmatically, but also on the research front. Um, so we've been working for the last couple of years with the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative to develop a methodology for measuring the effectiveness of GBV risk mitigation in nutrition interventions. Um, and I can say more about that if you'd like, but it's not um, the focus of this particular presentation. The focus of this presentation is um, really some, some work that we've been doing over the last few years um, that was sort of born out of a recognition that nutrition is such a data-driven sector. Um, and so we thought, okay, in addition to all our normal advocacy around it's everyone's responsibility to mitigate GBV within their programming, it's the right thing to do, it's quality programming, et cetera. Is there anything we can find in the literature about the linkages between exposure to GBV and nutrition outcomes? And so um, we began with a light touch desk review in 2019. This was just a group of volunteer graduate students who, who took a first stab. And they found some really interesting things. And based on that, 
we teamed up with this academic team, um, as I mentioned, Washington University and Columbia, to do a more robust rapid evidence assessment with you know, a structured methodology and um, a little bit more of a, I don't know, yeah, robust uh, approach to, to the research. And so we essentially looked at two different strands. One was GBV against girls under 18 and any linkages that could be found to their own nutrition outcomes. And the second one was um, intimate partner violence within the context of a household, a maternal caregiver experiencing intimate partner violence and any linkages to the children's nutrition outcomes in that household. Next slide. All right, so I think I'm passing over to you now, Lisa, is that right? Yes, thank you very much. So um, a rapid evidence assessment is similar to a systematic review, but we had to adapt um, some methodology in order to meet a shortened and condensed timeline and to make the results and the synthesis um, more applicable for policy and programmatic, pragmatic needs. So we first started with a systematic database search. We wanted to scour the literature um, that looks at violence and nutrition. So we, we combined um, important keywords that are used in this domain and searched the academic databases to retrieve these sources. I think we originally re retrieved over 4,000 sources. So we had to find a way to systematically screen through those sources to identify those, uh, those research articles that met our inclusion criteria and would help us answer our research questions and our research goals. So we then um, developed and refined our eligibility criteria. We screened the articles against that criteria and we were left with a final body of literature that met our inclusion criteria and would allow us to answer our research questions. And from that final number, which you'll see in a moment, we extracted relevant information by reading them in depth and synthesizing the material across sources. Um, and we were specifically looking at understanding how gender-based violence was measured, understanding how nutrition was measured, um, identifying key results and patterns across studies, as well as the methods used. And you'll get a taste of that today. So the first uh, findings that I'd like to discuss concern linkages between uh, girls' direct exposures to gender-based violence during childhood and adolescence and their own uh, nutrition outcomes also during childhood and adolescence. And this pathway, which we've term termed the direct pathway, um, yielded only 12 publications, most of which were conducted in high-income countries. So these are not resource-poor um, settings where we would expect a high degree of food insecurity. Most, most articles measured some form of sexualized violence, be that childhood sexual abuse perpetrated by parents or caregivers, sexual assault and rape perpetrated by peers or authority figures, and also dating violence and intimate partner violence perpetrated by um, partners, boyfriends, and this typically occurred later in adolescence. Most of the time these studies looked at um, measures for overweight, obesity, and increased adiposity, mainly through BMI, particularly in those adolescent age groups, um, but also weight for age in younger, uh, younger populations, namely children. There was also one study, which I will uh, talk about in a moment, that measured girl-child marriage as the GBV exposure and um, anemia as the nutrition outcome. So based on this body of literature, again, only 12 studies, the most compelling evidence is to support exposure to sexual violence during childhood and adolescence and elevated measures of BMI, which would indicate obesity and overweight. And uh, this sexual violence uh, can occur um, early in childhood from childhood sexual abuse and can be compounded by additional exposures, to sexualized violence from intimate partners or peers as, um, as the child progresses into adolescence. Now here's a study, the Ethiopia study that I was alluding to that looked at girl-child marriage and found a significant and positive association with anemia measured by low hemoglobin in adolescents. This is only one study and more research is needed to fully um, understand this pathway and this association. 
Um, and even with the pathway for sexual violence and elevated BMI, we need to understand what this pathway could look like and whether the same results would hold in a food insecure context, particularly because we know about the double burden of malnutrition. Even in low and middle income countries, there's both the risk of overnutrition and an Okay, so now we're going to switch gears and we're going to talk about the indirect pathway. And this isn't the indirect pathway because um, we're looking at maternal exposure to intimate partner violence and children's nutrition outcomes. So children are not directly exposed to gender-based violence. It is through their maternal caregivers. This yielded a larger evidence base, given that we found 72 publications. And all of these uh, publications were conducted in low and middle income countries that at one point had received humanitarian assistance since 2006. Most intimate partner violence measured multiple forms, physical, sexual, emotional, and mainly during pregnancy and lactation. Most nutrition outcomes measured um, were low birth weight following uh, breastfeeding and then undernutrition. And you can think of this literature base as studying the association between maternal intimate partner violence and three buckets of outcomes, low birth weight, feeding practices, mainly breastfeeding, and then measures of apparent child growth, um, namely undernutrition. So here are the main results. So I'm gonna first talk about the um, association between intimate partner violence and then uh, low birth weight. So this was the most compelling and striking finding that um, maternal exposure to combined forms of IPV and physical only IPV was uh, statistically and positively related to low birth weight. Um, and this was across a variety of low and middle income countries and it is a robust finding. The second um, interesting finding is between maternal IPV and feeding practices. Women who experience IPV were found to be less likely to practice exclusive breastfeeding or to engage in the early initiation of breastfeeding. One study also looked at minimal acceptable diet for children and found that exposure to maternal IPV um, was positively related to children not meeting minimally acceptable diet needs. Lastly, um, I'm going to talk about maternal IPV and apparent child growth. So this, um, this area of research uh, had inconsistent findings. Um, some positive, some non-significant could be issues with uh, sample size and power. But I want to draw your attention to three studies here, one of which had the largest sample size and reported that combined physical and sexual intimate partner violence was significantly associated with stunting for children under five years old. Um, so either uh, physical and sexual separate of each other or in combination. And stunting um, is a measure of chronic malnutrition, which is important to note here. Another study uh, reported that severe physical abuse was associated with severe and acute malnutrition. So this was low weight for age, so being um, undernourished in that sense. And a third study reported that exposure to controlling behavior was associated with significantly lower height for age, um, which is, is related to that stunting exposure. And there could be a variety of pathways and mechanisms that explain these findings. And I will touch upon some of those mechanisms that were either uh, directly tested in the literature that we reviewed or were mentioned as possible uh, pathways or hypotheses in which these results uh, could be taking place. So I want you to imagine that um, intimate partner violence against a maternal caregiver is a form of stress. Um, it could be a form of physiological or biological stress that has specific changes in hormone levels, particularly in pregnancy and cortisol levels that can uh, restrict fetal growth in utero or affect milk production. So that's one biological pathway. But we know that stress is not only biological, it's also psychological. And so the, the psychosocial stress of experiencing intimate partner violence could affect maternal mental health, postpartum depression, could also affect um, maternal coping behaviors um, related to caregiving, but also maladaptive coping behaviors like 
for example, smoking or alcohol use. And all of these, if intimate partner violence is occurring within a household um, where uh, there are perpetrators of violence, where that um, mom or maternal caregiver can't access the support she needs maybe from her husband or from other members of the, of, of the household. Um, and so these are just some, some hypothesized pathways that can affect these, these uh, nutrition indicators. And for stunting, a measure of chronic malnutrition, these pathways are occurring over time to reduce the stature of children. Um, physical trauma was also mentioned, for example, physical trauma of um, a woman who is pregnant due to physical intimate partner violence or sexual intimate partner violence can also affect some of these um, some of these nutrition indicators as well. So um, I'm going to move on here and pass the presentation on to Christine. Thanks, Louisa. And I think everyone can get, start getting a taste of all the learning that we've been doing about, <laughs> with the nutrition sector, getting all the lingo, understanding what, what speaks to them. Um, which kind of takes me into this slide, uh, some implications that we see for programming and policy. You know, it's, it's increasingly clear to us on the UNICEF side that both direct and indirect exposure to GBV has important implications for the effectiveness of nutrition interventions. This is something that our nutrition colleagues have told us anecdotally for years, but increasingly we're able to see it in, in the evidence base as well. Um, we think it gives us additional advocacy points collectively to promote uptake of GB, the GBV guidelines in the nutrition sector. Again, not replacing the arguments that we use around collective responsibility and, and everyone having a role to play, but actually just supplementing those with, um, you know, additional proof that that it's contributing to greater effectiveness in um, in nutrition programming, based on the metrics that that they use for for defining success. And um, also, we've seen that while the evidence base on the overlaps between these two issues is growing, there are still significant gaps, um, particularly when it comes to humanitarian context. So as Elisa mentioned, the context that we were able to capture for the indirect pathway, they were countries where a humanitarian crisis had occurred, but the data was not collected directly from the location of the humanitarian crisis. So that's um, an area that we think could be explored further. Next slide. So just looking ahead, um, we will be submitting a number of manuscripts based on the findings of the rapid evidence assessment to academic journals. We will soon be circulating um, a survey to capture additional practical examples of, of programming, of in integrating GBV into nutrition. Um, and also the team is available for key informant interviews if anyone in your circles um, would be interested in having a conversation like that. Um, we are currently doing a parallel study in South Sudan um, that's more focused on programmatic implementation and effectiveness of GBV risk mitigation in nutrition programming, but we see some nice opportunities for sort of crossover learning across the study in that one. Um, and we're also um, planning to develop a forward-looking research agenda. So really taking some of the gaps that have been identified and speaking to additional practitioners about you know, what, what some of the research priorities should be in the coming years. Um, so I will wrap it up there. We're happy to take questions in the chat or speaking or after the meeting. Thanks. Thank you, Christine. So this is people's opportunity to ask questions. I know some of you are actively working with the nutrition sector. So if you wanna share any of your own experiences, please do so as well. And feel free to just take off the, your mic and speak in case I'm missing any hands. No questions at all or everyone is timid. You can use the chat if you're feeling timid or if your microphone you don't think is working. Maybe while people are, are seeing if they want to ask a question, um, totally no pressure. We also, um, the first week of August is World Breastfeeding Week. And so we, we're in the process of preparing a, um, a brief specifically on the breastfeeding relating fi related findings um, as part of the, the cons for World Breastfeeding Week. So that'll be available shortly as well. Oh, that's great. I hope you'll share with us too um, 
send out with our monthly update and we'll let people know. Um, so, oh, here we have a question from Laura. Can we share this presentation with nutrition cluster coordinators to explore strategic collaborations? Great question. Yeah, we can certainly share. We can certainly share the presentation, and also um, there's a discussion with the global nutrition cluster right now about pulling together some kind of a similar presentation targeting nutrition cluster coordinators. So we can, I think, kind of target it from multiple angles. Yeah, and you know, we could also do a longer sort of webinar on this topic if there's interest from the different subclusters and nutrition people, and maybe we can get the coordinators together um, with. Uh, the nutrition, you know, we could we could discuss it at the global level and then have all of you invite um, people from your subcluster and from the nutrition cluster together. And as we enter the HNO HRP season, as we call it, um, this would be a great opportunity to give them a little um, gentle, coercive push, <laughs> encouragement, we call it. Um, to put an indicator on GBV into their HNO HRPs and have the opportunity to work on GBV in a very concrete way. So let's let's look at a potential. And we do, have, like I said, have a lot of coordinators on this call. Um, so if you also want to follow up with Christine Heckman, I'm sure she could put her email here in the chat for you to write to her directly, or you can write to us. We're in close contact and have been for years. Christine once upon a time worked in South Sudan, so many people know her well. Um, so thank you, that was super interesting. We're gonna move on to the next topic. And if you have a burning question that you didn't ask now, you can still ask it, I think, over the next topic if um, we still have people online who can respond. And so now we're gonna move on to the other thing uh, presentation, which is about e-referral pathways and virtual space. And this, a lot of this came up um, during COVID, I think, or actually even before COVID, but then got reinforced uh, about how brilliant it was during COVID. So um, yes, over, over to our next presenters. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to present and share updates on the digital Ruffle Pathway app today. This is uh, really nice. We're very excited. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Alexia Nissen, and uh, I'm working at UNICEF HQ on GBV and Emergency Innovation and Service Delivery. I'm currently covering for Caroline Masbunji, who I'm sure a majority of you knows very well uh, during her mother's leave. And I just wanted to share a big shout out to her as Caroline has been carrying this project from the very, very beginning. So just wanted to acknowledge it uh, before we start. And I'm here with my colleague, Joan. Uh, Joan, would you like to introduce herself? Um, sure. Um, so my name is Joan um, Nene, uh, the ERPW, the Digital Referral Pathway um, Product Manager, um, uh, working with Alexia and, uh, and other colleagues um, from UNICEF HQ. Thank you. Brilliant. So I think we can start with the presentation. Uh, I think Stephanie must have received uh, the PowerPoint. And um, I'm sure that some of you, if not many of you, have heard of the ERPW uh, already. Um, here it is. Exactly. The main objective of the presentation today is actually and for the first time, I believe, to show you the product. So Joan will uh, walk us through uh, the app in her demo. And we also wanted to provide you with some updates on where we are at, uh, the implementation and the way forward we envisage with uh, the GBV AOR. And so, first of all, you can go to the next slide. First of all, before starting with the demo, maybe a bit of uh, background for those who are less familiar with the product. Um, the ERPW is a digital tool that has been developed by UNICEF in collaboration with the GBV AOR and with the contribution of um, the US government. Uh, you can go to slide number two, please. In other terms, it's a tool um, that is developed by UNICEF on behalf of and uh, to support the GBV coordination. So the initiative acknowledges really all the challenges that um, we are facing uh, when it comes to keeping the referral pathways updated, ensuring wild dissemination of the referral pathways, 
and also making sure that the services mentioned in the referral pathways are survivor centered and indeed available, et cetera. So the main purpose of the app is really to provide um, an easy platform uh, to enable remote updating of services in real time and to disseminate information on quality services available more widely. So with the support of GBV AOR and the, the RIGA in particular, thanks to them, uh, four contacts have been identified and selected to pilot the ERPW this year. We have, first of all, yes, we're still on slide one. Can you please, uh, I think Stephanie has the control of the slides. But I'm, I'm feeling like it must be a technical problem. Steph, are you, uh, do you know what's going on? Uh, number two, please, the second slide. There you go. That's perfect. Sorry about that. So uh, yes, so I was saying four contexts uh, have been identified and, and selected for rolling out the ERPW this year. So we have, first of all, Bangladesh uh, and Zimbabwe for phase one with the basic version one of the product that you will see presented today in a few minutes. And we have Venezuela and Turkey cross border for the phase two with what we can call a, an improved version, a version two of the products with a higher level of details, information available and features as well. So in this context, we have received a formal commitment from the GBV AOR in country, uh, as well as from the UNICEF country office to deploy the product. And so far we feel that we, um, the, the country selection, let's say, has been really well done because first of all, uh, the coordination contexts are extremely different and it generates a lot of lessons learned that we can share when we expand the product. And also because of the, the high level of enthusiasm and ownership um, towards the products that we have from the interagency and from the GBV service providers in those countries. In terms of uh, process, we have chosen to adopt um, what we call a human-centered designed approach or HCD, where we have an extensive engagement with the GBV coordinators in country and the specialized GBV service providers. And their insights are continuously informing the development of the products to make sure that the products really meets the needs of the users. So we had basically a, a three-step process. The first one was the country selection. The second one was the res research, um, sorry, user research uh, with key stakeholders, coordination and GBV service providers. And the third phase was the app development based on the research and user testing findings. You can go to the next slide. In terms of um, expected outcomes for the users, thank you. First of all, for the GBV specialized uh, service providers, the app um, will be, as we said, an easy platform to update services they offer in real time, which is extremely convenient when you think about challenging contexts where security, turnover, volatile funding um, can continuously affect service provision. The app will also allow immediate access to information about available services when it comes to um, refer referral purposes. And also in the version two, the app will allow mutual um, feedback on the quality of the services um, and the overall referral experience. So just to note that the ERPW doesn't allow um, referrals embedded in the app. Um, it's, the app is focusing really on keeping the information updated and um, allowing to access this information. When it comes now to the benefits for um, the GBV coordination, the app will support regular uh, updates of the referral pathway by the GBV service providers, including through automatic notifications and reminders. We also have a um, vetting system uh, in the app to approve service inclusion and changes. So you will see during the demo um, that the coordinator will basically receive notification when a new service is entered and when changes are submitted by the service providers. So the coordinators can basically approve, reject, or ask for more information. And as mentioned, again, there will be a feedback mechanism to ensure uh, that the services are of quality and the referral pathway is effective. So for the time being, the use of the app um, is limited to the GBV coordination and to um, the specialized service providers. But once the product is adapted, the idea is to open the use to other service providers 
um, to community members, etc. So to gradually expand the use of the app beyond the circle of the interagency coordination and the specialized service provision. So those other stakeholders will have access to updated information on available services, and they will be able to provide feedback on services as well, as well as uh, access to other critical information we can say, such as um, some guidance on safe identification and referral, PSCA, et cetera. You can go to next slide. So the app is a progressive web application uh, that can be accessed by any device, would it be a mobile phone or, or a browser. We've also taken into account, you can go to next slide. We've also taken into account um, the context with low connectivity, which basically is the majority of our target context. And we made sure that the app can be used offline and online. And the app accommodates as well a multilingual environment. As of now, the content is available in English and in local languages for Bangladesh and Zimbabwe. We will adapt for Venezuela and um, TXB, Turkey Cross Border, by translating into Spanish, Arabic, uh, Kurdish. And of course, the app is also respecting the, the highest level, um, the highest standards when it comes to uh, data protection and privacy. That was a key priority. You can go to the following slide. And, and now we have reviewed basically the, the background, the processes and the outcomes of the app. I'll give the floor to Joan for the actual demo. Um, thank you, Alexia. Um, if uh, I can get permission to share my screen, please. Stephanie, it's still on um, the screen, the first slide chat. Can you just remove it? Are you able to go ahead and start talking before while well, Stephanie is trying to get this one off, maybe? Yes, yes, I can do that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. And thank you all for your patience as we wait for this. Um, so I will be taking you through the digital refer pathway, as my colleague Alexia just mentioned. Um, and as mentioned, we're, cur we're currently on phase one in, uh, in Bangladesh. And just a minute. So we're currently on phase one in Bangladesh and Zimbabwe. All right. Stephanie, it's still on the screen. I think I, I should be. There we go, there we go, now it's off, okay. Can you see my screen? We see Google. Okay, <laughs> that's good enough for a start. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we got rid of the other one now. Okay, here we go. And That's good. Pathways. Okay, perfect. Um, so I will be showing you um, the digital refer pathway um, um, as it has been deployed um, in in Bangladesh um, and Vene sorry and and Zimbabwe. So uh, the easiest way to get to the refer path, the digital refer pathway for Zimbabwe, for example, is zweerefer.org. So once you go there, you would get um, a prompt that would tell you welcome to the site. And also you will also have um, a small um, link here that will enable you to install um, the, ref the, the application on your device. So as Alexia mentioned, this is a progressive web application. So all it needs to be able to function is really a device that has an internet browser. So that can be um, uh, a tablet, uh, a mobile phone, a smartphone, um, or even a laptop. So the purpose is to ensure that um, uh, this is a application that can be used um, in the day-to-day -day lives um, of, of the service providers um, and not making their lives a bit more difficult by having to have a special um, device that they need to use for this. 
So um, you'd get a sign in um, prompt and be able to, to go through the referral pathway. So on the homepage of the referral pathway, um, you have the option of uh, selecting a location and then looking at the referral pathway. We'll get into the details of how the referral pathway together with all this service can come about. But basically any user um, who wants to see specifically, um, let's say it's health services, can be able to click on the tab health services and they would be able to see um, the details of the services available in that specific location. The refer pathway um, application also enables them to be able to change a location. I'm sorry about that. So the referral pathway also enables um, the user to be able to change um, the location and be able to see um, the details of a specific location. So this, um, as an example, this is Zimbabwe um, countrywide, but one can be able to select Zimbabwe and um, Gora um, to a very specific province in Zimbabwe, let's say it's Harare, and go to a very specific district. So that makes it a bit easier um, in terms of navigation and being able to, to understand and see exactly um, how, how, that, how the different services provided in the different areas. Um, so just to go um, into the into the signed in version of the referral pathway. So one thing that uh, my colleague Alexia mentioned is the, it's, the application is for service providers together with the GBV coordination. And uh, one of the features that the GBV coordination has at the moment is being able to vet um, the users that are, are registered um, on the application together with the service provider um, changes. So service provider changes, should it be that there's a new um, service provided by an organization or there's a change in the way that the services are provided. This is something that the GBV coordination team is able to review and verify before these changes are made available on the refer pathway. So this specific um, section that you're seeing up here is specifically um, for the GBV coordination to be able to make sure that you know the approval, the users that will have access to changing the information and also be able to approve the service um, changes before they are reflected in the refer pathway. So the way um, the application has been uh, designed and based on uh, the comments and, uh, and the insights we, we found from, from the users during the human-centered design pro pro process, um, uh, users at the moment um, are able to self-register, but the self-registration is only applicable for the service providers. So service providers can register, but before they're approved um, and able to use the service, this is where um, the GBV coordination will approve. But we have um, the coordination team, so the GBV coordinator, the information manage Officers, this will be specifically um, registered at the manage application user, where a user can come specifically add the user and be able to add all the details and then be able to select um, the specific role. In addition to that, um, the application enables um, one to be able to manage the different service types. So one is able to add um, a specific service type for for a location. So as an example, I'll just show you how, um, how a service type is added on the application. Sorry about the delay. So here we go. So here one can be able to add um, a service type. So let's say this is uh, an emergency um, accommodation, um, as an example, one can be able to select, um, you know, an icon that is that is making sense for this. And again, these icons are derived from um, the OCHA um, uh, database of icons. So one can be able to say, you know, this is maybe emergency accommodation. One can also be able to select the color of the icon um, and also be able to publish, and this will be available as part of the service types. So this is just um, an example of the different service types and how one can be able to add a service type. Um, and then specifically um, for the service providers, um, they can be able to change or also can be able to add new. Um, but again, as I mentioned, they can all, these changes are only affected once um, they're approved by the GBV coordination. So now I'll show you how one is able to add um, the, a, a service. Um, that is provided by a specific organization. So when you go to manage service, one can uh, go and select a specific service. 
um, select um, the location. So if it's, let's say, in Zimbabwe, um, in, uh, in Bulawayo, um, in Bulawayo Central, they can be able to select the type of service from what we just um, looked into a few minutes ago. So let's say emergency accommodation can be able to select the organization that actually um, is providing that service. So let's say um, I'm packed. And then let's say um, the number of staff providing the service, the opening hours, cost of service, transportation available, accessibility for persons with disabilities. So these are fields that um, we, we had on, um, on this first phase, and we've, been, we've also been improving them over time as we've been getting um, great insights um, from the testing, from the training, you know, the sort of transportation information available. So this is something that will improve in the next version, including with accessibility for disability, for persons with disability. So we'll have the different categories. And as mentioned, it's now in the first phase, but we're continuously um, improving this to ensure that um, it's meeting it's meeting the need of the users on the ground. So again, with age group, one is able to select, um, you know, if it's uh, two, three age groups, so it's all age groups. Um, also, the target group um, is the service provided for the host community, provided for the refugees or returnees. And uh, another important field is now the contact field, whereby one is able to add um, the hotline or landline number, um, the service mode. So is it in person? Is it remote? Um, is it mobile? Um, and then the, the, num the name of the focal person together with the phone number of the focal person, um, and as well as the name of the backup focal person together with the email of the backup focal person. In addition to that, one thing that we realized um, during uh, the whole process is, you know, service providers have um, very specific um, uh, services they provide in some in some scenarios and uh, very specific inform information that they would like to have it available there. So we've seen um, that this field of add more details has provided a, a very good uh, um, platform for service providers to be very much specific in terms of you know what one can expect should another service provider um, refer a survivor to the organization. So this has also come in very handy um, and uh, this basically um, is the information that one is able to add. Um, as a GBV coordination team and also as a service provider. However, the service provider, this information is only updated on the refer pathway once um, it's, 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 it's vetted and reviewed and approved from their end. So with that being um, a, a way of adding the information regarding the service um, uh, that, that, that different organizations provide, um, one other um, important feature is really managing the refer pathway, which is basically organizing and ensuring that the refer pathway um, the refer pathway has all the service types that are required and has the, the service types in the correct order. Um, Etc. So I'll just add um, a refer pathway now as an example. And I'll select Zimbabwe. Um, I'll have you the immediate response. And then I'll, uh, I, one can be able to add um, a refer pathway for a very specific location should there be um, a change. However, um, yeah, so we have here the section name. So if one has, let's say, immediate response where there are a number of service types that would come and the immediate response, this is where they would go to. And then one can also add another section of other services, which are not necessarily the immediate response and service types. So we can have here the immediate response and health services, and we'll have the service types um, come up just as we added them on the different service type. We can have psychosocial services, psychosocial services, um, we can have safety and security, um, we can have um, legal services. Again, this is really depending on, on the specific location and uh, how the GBV coordination uh, will provide the service types for the refer pathway. So once we, we, we're able to publish this um, here, 
we have that and we can be able to see um, this specific referral pathway. So let's say we go to Zimbabwe and uh, go to Bulawayo, can be able to see um, the different service types as we had as we added them on the referral pathway and uh, can be able to select health services and be able to um, see the different services under health services. So for example, if I click um, ARC, um, we'll be able to see all the different um, details regarding ARC, such as you know the type, the opening hours, closing hours, the cost of services, um, you know the focal person, the phone number of the focal person, and the likes. Um, so in addition to this, we've also allowed um, the application to have so much flexibility, um, enabling uh, managing locations such as, you know, if there is a change in location, a camp that was there before that is no longer there before, one can be able to delete the location, one can be able to add a new location, should it be a district or a camp, and then also organizations um, that would come up or would not be there anymore. So this is just... Um, an overview or of some of the features we have on the digital refer pathway. And I look forward um, to, to responding to, to different questions that you might be having. I think I'll hand it over to my Alexia. And also, let me just see if I can share the presentation as well. So it's easier. Yeah, and you have a question from Hannah, if this is gonna become worldwide, like have availability worldwide after you finish piloting. Um, and I see that Sylvia has said, if she understands correctly, the standardization of the service delivery types is done through review approval of the GBV subcluster. Would it be possible for the GBV subcluster to have a list of service delivery types cited? Um, sorry, uh, Fulvia X, TX, or your abbreviation there, by the subcluster so that the information a user adds fits into what is already decided based on the need. Do you want to maybe just raise that question? Um, well, yes, since I didn't interpret it very well. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. I was, uh, I was interested in this uh, since, uh, since I heard about it. So uh, it's lovely to see the demo as well. Yeah, my question is from from what I understood, like uh, a user could uh, uh, add a service delivery type um, and then this is going to be reviewed and approved by the GBSA cluster because before it is published, let's say. So my point is then we could have uh, different users that actually offer similar service um, types, uh, but they call it different things. So wouldn't it be possible for the GP cluster to decide and agree on a, a list of service delivery types uh, from which then the user can select so that we standardize the types of service delivery, if that makes sense, and if I had understood correctly. Thank you so much. I think that's a great question, Fulvi, and I just want to say we know that the um, protection cluster is now asking people to put in information. They're calling it referral pathways, but it seems like it's just putting in different organizations that offer services. And what's not clear is if there's been any vetting to see what the quality of those different services are. So I, I think you know this is a great question about um, you know, how, how is the vetting being done to make sure it is a quality service? So back over to you, Alexia or John. Um, thank you, th maybe I can start. Oh, John, go ahead. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, um, Fulvia, for your question. Um, actually, what you just mentioned is correct. The, only the GBV coordination has the ability to add the different service types. The service providers are only, add, are only able to add the different services they have. And when they go add services, all they're able to do is select a service type, which is already added by the GBV coordination. So just to... Just to um, clarify there the, the the service providers do not add the different services I, I just went through all the different features to show you for the purpose of the demo but the way the system is set up only coordination is able to add that thank you alexia please no exactly i, I just wanted to say i think also uh, verena from uh, zimbabwe had a 
had a very good um, comment over it. She was yeah. basically saying uh, this is um, what uh, Zimbabwe is actually doing, trying to um, harmonize a little bit and have a common understanding of the different um, services available and the terminology. So uh, this is uh, definitely what we aim for. But thank you for the question, Rosia. Uh, Jennifer, if I may, we still have a, a few slides that might answer some of the questions okay. that are raised in the chat. So I just wanted sure. to make sure that we can go to, uh, yeah, yeah, to the ahead. end of the presentation. Thank you so much. Um, so probably before giving the floor back for feedback and questions, maybe just a word on where we're at when it comes to uh, the implementation in the various countries and uh, also the next step that we are envisaging. So we are having uh, these countries that we call phase one countries, um, basically Bangladesh and Zimbabwe as mentioned. And uh, in Zimbabwe and Bangladesh, uh, the research process is now finalized and the content has been developed on the basis of um, the findings and the GBV coordination and the service providers are now trained. Uh, Joanne is just back from Zimbabwe where she supported the training in Harare and the regions. Um, the use of the app is now being uh, monitored. We are checking on the activity on the app, bus training to see what's happening there. Um, and we keep on collecting feedback from the users related to the tech aspects or the content to improve the app in the second version. Um, next slide, please. For Venezuela and Turkey cross-border, the phase two countries, uh, we are currently following up on the country work plan. Um, we have we are done with the phase of planning and assessment. Uh, we are now focusing on uh, the research research aspects. Uh, we are um, recruiting uh, in Turkey cross border a research consultant that is going to help us with the HED process, and very soon we will initiate the recruitment in Venezuela. We will be able then to launch the research phase to understand better uh, the needs and the priorities of the users. We do expect this phase to be faster and easier than for the country's phase one, as we now have a product in place. So we're talking more adaptation and contextualization than development per se. And to answer the question in the chat related to the process, um, following the contextualization phase, once uh, the product is also cleared by the GBV AOR in country, there will be uh, the training phase and uh, the go live phase. And in terms of timeline for the country's phase two, we are aiming at having the product deployed by end of year. So in terms of immediate next steps uh, with the products, this is the next slide, please. We are providing the required support to countries phase one, as we mentioned. We are also working on developing new features on the app, including uh, the feedback functionality that we call the Yelp functionality. We are also thinking of adding uh, automatic reminders, um, maps, etc. And we will be preparing uh, for the launch in countries phase two before end of year. On the side, we're also working on the m and &E aspects um, to understand how the app is working how it's actually useful for uh, GBV service providers and coordinators. For now, it's still very much um, activity level, but we hope to be able to develop um, framework more robust, uh, more solid with time where the triangulation of data can uh, indicate some positive trends, hopefully. And we are also um, starting developing a sustainability plan to avoid um, discontinuation and disengagement from the app over time. This is a critical issue because after the training, you need to keep momentum and you need to make sure that, um, you know, the app is, is used independently of, of further investments. In terms of the longer term way forward, um, we would definitely love to have a follow up discussion with the GBV AOR to understand also the coordination needs and the priorities in regards to the RPW to orient the future of the app and to see how we can work together as well to, to develop it further. What we have in mind um, is definitely that we should adapt uh, the app for all the target groups, as we mentioned earlier, meaning other service providers and committee members, also develop new features um, as identified by uh, the research in the new countries. We would also like very much to explore possible linkages with other products. Uh, would it be the virtual safe space, um, Primero, the internet of good things, um, and, and other products that are out there where we see a potential uh, for, for having those links being made. 
And of course, we would love to expand the use of the app to additional countries as we feel there is a high interest and like an appetite from different countries to explore how the app can be used um, in their context. The RPW can be easily deployed to countries that are similar to countries phase one and phase two, um, such as, for instance, uh, from Venezuela to Colombia or Ecuador, um, from TXB maybe to North East Syria, Iraq, uh, the same language, similar context, but uh, if there is interest in funding available uh, global, regional, or country level, we could also contextualize for a different context, such as uh, French-speaking African countries, for example. Um, so this is something we, we would be happy to explore together. And ultimately, also to answer to another question that um, was raised in the chat, uh, what we would like is to have the ERPW widely available for the humanitarian community, uh, also, it will be a way to, to prevent duplication um, and have the, the source code of the ERP available to become um, a digital public good with the intention of handovering um, the product when it's uh, ready to be safely duplicated. So this is um, what we wanted to share today. Of course, we'd be happy to hear your feedback and answer any questions you might have, uh, we took a lot of time, uh, we're conscious of time, so we'll be super available, uh, Joan and I, for further uh, discussions, uh, maybe when they relate to, um, you know, bilateral discussions on specific countries or, or on the sustainability bit, etc. So I will put my uh, email address and, and Joe's email address in the, in the uh, chat. Oh, we have it here. Perfect. Thank you. Over. Yeah, thank you. And I see that there's a lot of interest. Also, um, Kate Ruby is on from the GBVMS and had some questions. Um, so maybe you can respond to her bilaterally. But like I said, we have a lot of coordinators on the call. And um, you would think we had planned it this way because we have Fulvia from the whole of Syria hub, which includes Turkey, Ross Border. And we also have Cecilia, who's our Riga now in Lacro region. And we have um, Christina, who's the GBV subcluster from Venezuela. So. We do have a lot of people who are in countries that you're setting up. And I think in the LACRO region in Colombia and Venezuela, they have developed some of their own apps on some of these. So it might be good to also find out what's already being used and what can be um, shared. And then just a reminder to everyone, this is no magic bullet, right? In the same way that I constantly have to remind people outside of the GBV sector, having a, you can't create a referral pathway if, you, if services don't exist. And having an app with fancy technology isn't going to create the service. So it's only as good as services that are available and keeping it up to date. You know, like if, again, this is something that's really gonna to need to be um, kept up to date in order to, to function in a viable way. So, so I hope once the sort of novelty of the technology wears off, we're not gonna stop updating it. So, so just to say, I think it's, it's um, also critical for us to continue to advocate for services in remote locations and rural, rural locations um, where, you know, you don't want to click on an area here and find out there's nothing available. So, so it's, it's really good, I think, also to keep reminding ourselves that we need to advocate um, to, to address the needs where services don't exist. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of interest and people are still uh, writing in um, the chat and please feel free to continue writing in the chat and we can definitely organize a call. We can do it at two different times if we need to have a better time to the Lacro region compared to um, other regions since the time is always a bit of a challenge. Um, but thank you very much. And unfortunately, we only have 15 minutes left. So I'm going to ask us to, to move on, but definitely we can um return to these topics in another dialogue i wouldn't call it a webinar we can have a, a, a more in-depth chat um, or you can also reach out bilaterally especially if you're one of the phase two um, countries so we wanted to end with just um, a bit of sharing of impressions from our very recent in-person and also online hybrid um, gbv coordinator week um, and that took place in Budapest. And I just wanna say if people can remain online a little bit longer, I know there's a lot of coordinators here who probably want to share also their impressions. So that we have asked Christina from um, Venezuela and Amira from uh, Gaza, uh, OPT to, to share their impressions. I will try to be very short just to say that um, this was our annual event 
Uh, this year we did a global one. Um, the GPC had done a regional one, but we really wanted to bring our coordinators together at the global level, especially because there are so many similarities between, for example, LACRO and uh, the Latin America and Caribbean uh, together with Asia and the Pacific, where there's a lot of need for preparedness around natural disasters or man-made disasters. And I am saying the word man intentionally there. Um, and so the idea was really to bring everyone together. And we also know there was a high turnover. Um, so we wanted to sort of go through the minimal deliverables with our new coordinators who haven't necessarily been part of a coordination handbook um, training or rollout. And also hear from um, people in the field, what are the emerging um, issues and challenges as well as sharing among peer-to-peer, -peer, um, the coordinators sharing challenges, but also solutions that they found or new innovative ideas. Um, and really, I think everyone was just very excited to, to be able to meet each other and um, increase a network of people that goes beyond the RIGAs and the coordination team. And, and now I think people are reaching across countries and regions to, to share with each other. We had 25 coordinators in person um, from five different regions. And one thing that was new this time is that we also included information management officers um, from the RIGAs, but also from some of the country offices, which I think was really exciting for all of us. We had a much stronger um, representation from Latin America and the Caribbean. We had languages um, in Spanish and French available online for both people online as well as people in the room. Um, so that felt good that we could offer um, different languages, although there's still more work to be done in that area. Um, and we even had people from Latin America starting at 3 a.m. in the morning, so bless them. Um, and then just to say, this is the first time we've had a hybrid event and we had um, about 15 people online and uh, they said it worked out well, but we felt like we could probably do a better job and hope to look at um, good practices from other hybrid uh, events in the future to improve. So I think that's what I wanted to share. I, also just to say, since I know there's a lot of risk mitigation people on this call, since UNICEF is here and we heard from nutrition, um, we did have a session where people shared what they've been doing with other clusters. And it was such a huge response um, that, you know, I think our takeaway is we'd like to look at how to better document the different um, practices that people have been implementing in the field, the successes that coordinators have had, at, especially during the sort of HNO HRP of getting other clusters to engage um, and see if we could maybe hire a consultant or something to put together the practices that are um, ongoing that can be shared um, across the different countries. We had new countries um, like Ukraine, who was also, you know, looking to hear from other countries who are already uh, doing this kind of work. So um, that was exciting. And um, yeah, I don't want to use up all the time with me talking. So I'm going to turn over first to Amira from Gaza, if you want to give five minutes of your impressions, and then we will move on to Christina. Over to you, Amira. Hi, Geneva. I hope you hear me very well. Yes, you're very clear. Actually, uh, this annual activity or retreat is uh, very was very good opportunity for Palestine coordination team uh, because, uh, as you mentioned, that we met with the coordinators from different countries. So we present Palestine case and we exchange experience with different colleagues from different countries, from Sudan, from uh, Zim, uh, Myanmar, uh, and we networking better with the uh, HQ colleagues and Astro colleague, colleagues. Actually, the uh, agenda of the retreat was very rich one, and uh, Palestine started uh, to roll out the male engagement strategy. So the session strategy was very helpful for us. And uh, the, uh, the HNO uh, 
uh, uh, HRP session, which is very, very interesting, that apply the working group modality and practices between the colleagues and uh, the role uh, play model, which help us a lot how to deal and advocate <laughs> with OCHA protection colleagues. And uh, actually, I would like to thank uh, the presenter. I, I'm sorry, I forgot her name, which give us uh, the presentation related to advocacy or donor uh, uh, advocate uh, for, uh, for donor, which is very helpful for, for me, for myself. Uh, and it gives me many tools to advocate uh, GBV priorities, concerns, uh, yes, <laughs> uh, and uh, help us a lot. So uh, for example, yesterday I had a meeting with the, uh, the, uh, the, the Belgium Council, which helped me a lot this session, how to advocate and to present GBV priorities, gaps, challenges in front of high level missions. Uh, also, um, the, the minimum standard session, which helped me a lot to open channel with GBV partners to uh, how to build their program, advocate uh, uh, for many or uh, uh, um, advocate uh, uh, in Gaza, at least, to apply this minimum standard when they are start their programs. And uh, of course, uh, I had the chance to meet uh, with many people uh, which helped, for example, Marta, which helped me uh, to understand the women-led organization assessment uh, in, uh, I hope, in Somalia, uh, and uh, give me, uh, and I will, I will email her so she can send for me the uh, tool that they use. So the retreat was a very good opportunity for networking between the coordinator, and I feel like I'm with my colleagues, my family, helping, supporting all the time. So I would like to thank Jennifer, uh, Stephanie, Shiva, who uh, prepared the modality and uh, which uh, uh, the modality for this retreat and the agenda and the practices, uh, exercises, which help us to feel the three days that I attended uh, very interesting and not boring. So thank you for this good and helpful and powerful retreat. And I hope I can join more and more in the coming period. Thank you for that certification of not being boring. Um, I appreciate that. Um, so moving over to Christina, who is actually sitting in Spain at the moment, so she is in a better time zone. Um, over to you, Christina, who works in Venezuela. Hi, Jennifer, and hi, colleagues. It's so good to see now familiar faces. It used to be familiar names, but now we can say uh, we are sharing this space with uh, familiar faces, which is one of the highlights of, the, of this retreat, right? Because it gave us like the opportunity to actually connect with other colleagues from other regions in a more human sense. Uh, in that sense, well, well, I agree with everything that Amira just uh, said. I would also add that it was a very important, uh, well, uh, sharing group for us. It, it was like, I can say it was like a safe space for us uh, where we could uh, vent out about the frustrations that we face and uh, to share the same challenges and experiences that we uh, all face in our context and that perhaps we don't share it with other people uh, from uh, this group, right? Because we don't feel maybe confident enough to say, well, uh, I don't feel good enough. What I'm doing uh, in my uh, coordination group is not, is not good enough, right? Because I don't, I'm not able to advocate with OTA, for instance, to include more TV questions on MSNA. Uh, assessments, right? But it was really good to share that all the coordinators face the same challenges and the same issues. So it gave us, well, it was very empowering for, for me, particularly, and also for our team in Venezuela. Uh, also, uh, perhaps uh, I could also highlight the fact that sharing experiences and sharing good practices and hearing and learning from those practices um, it was very useful for us in Venezuela, uh, hearing uh, particularly from experiences in, in the region like Colombia, particularly in terms of localization, uh, 
uh, I can say mm -hmm. that, uh, well, while Colombia and Venezuela share like uh, common similarities to the context, I haven't heard uh, from the actual uh, experience from uh, from Colombia before I went to the retreat. So it was very enlightening for me. Uh, and also, yeah, for, for our work plan, let's say, because um, now we can apply the same approaches that uh, Colombia is applying to their context in terms of localization and leadership of women-led organizations. And I went back to, to my team team after the retreat and I uh, introduced this initiative like the way they are working in Colombia and uh, well everybody was very happy to to hear about this experience because it will help us a lot because our context is very challenging especially in terms of like reaching uh, remote areas uh, because uh, we don't have humanitarian presence in those areas but we have women-led organizations working in those areas because both Colombia and Venezuela have uh, or share like a common, uh, you know, women's rights activism from the past. So uh, we, I mean, we learned that we can leverage from those experience and empowering also women-led organizations uh, to, to become a GBV AOR or GBV subcluster leaders. So in that sense, I propose to, to our team, uh, well, to apply this approach, like having women-led organizations uh, leading uh, subnational uh, GBB working groups. And now I can say that uh, we are in the process of mobilizing resources with uh, the embassy of Holland. Uh, so we, we touched that, that uh, yeah, <laughs> Jennifer. So we proposed, uh, <laughs> uh, well, we had an, uh, a meeting with the embassy of Holland and they are willing, now we're in the process of, we have to, to develop further this uh, initiative. So they bought the idea, they like it because uh, in Venezuela we are like transitioning out to a more uh, nexus approach, which is like, I mean, it fits very well with the new approach, the like the humanitarian uh, context is evolving too, right? So uh, empowering and building the capacity of women-led organizations to ensure like the sustainability of the GBB coordination, it's key for us right now, especially given the, the, the lack of resources that we may face uh, in the future. So, uh, well, um, now we have included this initiative or this approach into our work plan, and we are working to mobilize uh, those resources so we can build the capacity uh, of those organizations uh, so they can actually lead uh, the GBB sub working groups, uh, well, in, in remote areas of the country where there is no uh humanitarian presence at all not even for unfpa right so yeah i wanted to 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 share this experience and also i will take the opportunity uh to to say to diana sarria that we are planning to have a meeting with you if you are willing to not that you are i saw that you are here so you can share the, the experience that you have developed in colombia with our team so i mean we can build upon this experience um, as well. So uh, I don't know if I still have more time, Jennifer, but uh, I wanted to, to say also that uh, it was very good to see like uh, all colleagues uh, to meet new colleagues, uh, and particularly Paula Ramirez, right? And as uh, Sara Martin was, uh, was sharing, uh, about her trauma and stress reduction approach to GBB responders, uh, well, uh, while Paula has worked in Venezuela with our colleagues uh, before, now after re the, this retreat, I was also enlightened like, okay, we can actually bring Paula to Venezuela so that she can apply this methodology to, uh, to the GBB subcluster, not only working with UNFPA colleagues. So we talked to uh, Erin Gerber, who is our uh, focal point for the CMCBI experience. And well, we got like additional uh, funding for implementing GBB staff care activities. So we are planning to bring uh, Paula Ramirez to Venezuela 
so she can uh, support the GBB sub cluster members uh, in that sense. So hopefully by the end of this year, because uh, we'll have the TOT, the GBB case management TOT in September and after that. So we want to take the opportunity to bring uh, Paula so she can also train uh, the, the GBB case management uh, trainers on this uh, stress reduction uh, approach uh, methodology. Um, well, basically, yeah, uh, I wanted to share these two examples of uh, how this uh, retreat translated into concrete actions for us uh, in Venezuela. Apart from uh, like the human aspect of the retreat, right? That we we had a lot of fun. We hung out with colleagues. Uh, we had the opportunity to to uh, have team building activities as well, no? Facilitated by <laughs> uh, Jennifer. Uh, so it was a really nice experience, and I would like to thank Jennifer for. Uh, giving me the opportunity to participate uh, in this uh, retreat. So thank you. Thank you, Christina. And I, I, I'm hearing some great ideas already. Um, I mean, I would have never occurred to me that Poland would be a, a donor that we could advocate with for women-led organizations. So maybe everyone should try approaching your embassy from Poland, especially now that they're helping so many Ukrainians. Maybe they're understanding more the importance of humanitarian work. So, so good for you on, on that one. Good to know that some funding can be provided um, through Aaron Gerber for Paula's work. That's, that's uh, creative thinking. I think um, in, in general, GBV actors, whether they're programming or coordination are off the charts when it comes to creative thinking because we encounter so many obstacles that we have to be quite creative to address them. So I think either a creative people are attracted to GBV work or we become creative as we do the work because it's, it's a survivor <laughs> uh, skill that we need to have. And just to, to build on the localization, I also um, heard the coordinator from who's working in Ethiopia say that um, he learned a lot from ARI, from Myanmar, and also plans to change the way that the work is being done on localization. So I think a lot of um, cross fertilization. And I do want to just also say the reason we went to Budapest, some people asked us, is because UNICEF, who, you know, we know that UNICEF is on this call, so I'll just say UNICEF has a training center in Budapest, and we were able to meet there without having to pay for the venue. Um, and they really are set up quite well for having uh, hybrid meetings. And so we were very well received and the evaluation showed a very positive response to the care that we got at um, UNICEF. The only problem I think that we faced, uh, which is actually a pretty important problem, was that um, Hungary as a country is not the most receptive to people from some nationalities. And our two local coordinators who we had invited had their visas denied. Um, and we had a lot of uh, challenges getting visas and had to provide extra documentation for some of our um, other coordinators. So, so that was a challenge, unfortunately, that we weren't able to surpass in, in all cases. Um, but I did want to give a shout out to, to UNICEF. And um, I, I realize it is 4.05, so if people need to get off the call, um, you're, you're welcome to end. I know some people have other meetings, but if people want to stay on a few extra minutes, I just wanted to give a chance to anybody else of the coordinators who wanted to share an experience uh, from, from the meeting. I, if you feel free just to open your mic if you are not, or if you want to raise your hand, you can raise your hand. Um, I don't see anyone else, so then I think we probably, people need to stick to the time. Um, so thank you all for joining our call today. And I have to say, we were wondering if we should have canceled this call um, because of it being during vacation for many people. But we had uh, 57 people on the call. So um, I'm glad that we didn't cancel. No, 67, sorry, we had 67 on this call, which goes to show that not everyone goes on holiday when there's a humanitarian emergency going on somewhere in the world. And um, 
We did have uh, our BHA person from USAID on the call, but she's not here anymore. So I'm sorry she didn't get to hear um, some of the localization uh, work that was shared. Marta, who was mentioned, is part of the project that is being supported by BHA with uh, TROCARE and the GBB AOR to look at um, co-coordination and Somalia and South Sudan are the two countries where um, that effort is being piloted and we hope will catalyze others to support how we can do a better job of having co-coordinators who are women-led or women rights organizations. So um, just, yeah, please encourage if you're not from UNFPA and you are here from another agency, we would love to have support because it's all about coaching and mentoring um, and then supporting women-led and women rights organizations to take on a coordination role. Um, but we also did discuss how to have meaningful participation by subcluster members. And we would really like to see that supported by all of our NGO, INGO members as well as our UN members. So um, good, good to keep that in mind. So thank you everyone. It was a delightful call and it really appreciated all of you who stayed on a few extra minutes and thank you for all of the presenters. I think it was super interesting and I see that we need to have a couple of follow-ups to address properly the comments that came up in the chat and um, many emails were shared. So please do also feel free to get in touch directly. Thank you all, big applause for everyone. Have a nice rest of your day. Thank you, bye. Bye.